It is hard to find clear and definitive guidelines and explanations about Messiah and about the Messianic era. The entire subject is deliberately shrouded in mystery. We aren't given clear details about Messiah and the Messianic era and how it will all unfold. And it's interesting that it's almost like we're deliberately being misled when we are presented ambiguous or unclear or amorphous descriptions about Messiah. As they just tell us that when Jacob was on his deathbed, chapter 49 of Genesis, he gathers his children and he says, come and I will reveal to you what will happen in the end of days, i.e. what will happen at the end of the days of this world, at the end of the 6,000, namely in the era of Messiah. Jacob wanted to reveal to his children about what's going to be with Messiah. But then he gets there, and the Shechina departs from him, Rashi tells us. And he was unable to reveal it. And instead, he started talking about other things. So Jacob wanted to provide to his children, and by extension to the Jewish people, more clarity about what Messiah is all about, and how it's all going to unfold, and the Almighty did not allow him to do that. Now, it's interesting, in his blessings that he does give to his sons, he does, in fact, talk about Messiah. In the blessing of Judah, Judah is the forbearer of David and of the Messiah. Well, Jacob himself talks about Messiah. So we have this unusual reality where we're not given clarity in what's going to happen, but we are given hints. We are told some stuff about it, but they are deliberately unclear and ambiguous. And there are some really good reasons we are told why this has to remain unclear. A, it allows for a messianic test. Like the Rambam tells us, there are going to be false messiahs. There's going to be false messianic prognostication. The fact that we are told some stuff about Messiah, but not everything, and it's not detailed and organized clearly, that gives rise to the potential of messianic charlatanism. And that's part of the design. Part of the tests is we have to not try to figure out what Messiah is coming to. We have to be faithful to God and understand that he's running the show and be desirous and covetous and yearn and anticipate for Messiah, but to do it almost in a passive way, to not try to figure out and not try to push the envelope so much, to wait, to anticipate, to yearn. And that's the design. We're told a little bit, but not too much. And there's room for ambiguity, and there's room for that test of messianic charlatanism, as we mentioned. Moreover, if we did know the details, it could be very disenchanting. Suppose you know that Messiah's not going to come for another 10 years, 15 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. That's very disappointing. We want it to come today. And it would also remove the pressure. Our objective is to get as much done before Messiah comes. If you know you have a thousand years, well, then there's, there's less pressure. In a similar way, our sages tell us that no one knows exactly when they're going to die. Even King David, who really wanted to know when he's going to die, God said, I'm not going to tell you. And that allows us, or that encourages us, to try to live every day as if it were our last, and thus to maximize our time here. And in fact, the Talmud tells us the book of Pesachim on page 54b, there are seven things that are concealed from humanity. Number one on the list is the day of death. You don't know when you're going to die. 
Number six on that list is we don't know when Messiah is going to come. These are hidden from us, and that is by design. Perhaps a third reason why Messiah is hidden from our eyes is because we have a role to play. We have some free will in determining whether the world is ready, is primed for Messiah. And therefore, there cannot be a definitive timeline for Messiah. And we can't behold the details because it's up to us to determine, A, why Messiah is coming, B, in what manner is Messiah coming. There's some variability, as we shall yet see at length. There is variability in how Messiah can unfold. And therefore, it's kind of up to us. We get to write the script. We get to determine how it's going to be. And therefore, maybe that's yet another reason why the details are somewhat obscure. But this is a long way of saying that trying to find scintillating clarity in understanding Messiah and how it's all going to go down, it's really impossible. And we're going to try to do it nonetheless. And we understand that ultimately this subject is mysterious, but our sages did tell us some elements about Messiah. And if we want to understand the subject clearly, as we do in this series, we're going to try to ponder and explore what we are told by our sages. And we've learned that Messiah is a time of dramatic, tectonic transformation. Before the year 6,000, the world must be completely perfected. This is the absolute deadline by which the world and all its inhabitants, must be brought to perfection. And all evil, by that time, must be banished. And the crown and the dominion of God, by that time, must be revealed to all. This is a very different world than our world. And to illustrate how unique that world is, we spoke about last time briefly about the various prayers that we say when we are yearning and hoping for Messiah. We talked about the Elenu prayer and the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services. And it's helpful to see these prayers in their full context and to see other elements of these prayers to really reinforce what that world looks like. And if you notice in these prayers, there is a word that's being emphasized again and again. And that is the totality of the transformation. Messiah is a world where you don't have these, you know, uh, uh, righteous people here and there scattered throughout the world. The righteousness is completely inclusive. Everyone, everyone, everyone is on board. In the Elenu prayer, we talk about how we yearn to quickly see in the glory of the Almighty's might and to remove all the foreign deities from the world and to destroy all the pagan idols and to fix the world Tikkun Olam, with the kingdom of God, V'chol Bnei Basar, and all flesh will call out in your name. And all evil will turn back to you. And all the inhabitants of the world will know and will understand that to you all knees will bend. And all tongues will pledge allegiance to you. Again, this idea of all. Kol Ashon, Kol Barach, Kol Yoshua Sevel, Kol Basar, Kol Reshi Aretz. Everyone will accept the yoke of your kingdom. 
you're going to rule over the over the whole world. There is universality, ubiquitousness to the acceptance of God. Similarly, in the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur prayer, and we talked about last time one of the prayers. This is another one of the prayers. Maloch al kol olam kul Rule over the entire world with your honor. And be exalted over the entire land. And appear with your greatness over all the inhabitants of the world. And all creations, all creations should know that you created them. And all things that are formed will know that you formed them. And all that have a soul, they will all declare, God, the God of Israel, he's the real king, and his dominion rules all. We're describing a radically different world than the one that we're used to. A world where the goodness has totally permeated every nook and cranny. God will rule over the entire world, be exalted over the entire land, appear in your splendor over all the inhabitants. And all creations will know that you created them. And all formations will know that you formed them. And all that have a soul will declare God's dominion. Every single being, every creation, every person will be fully submitted to God. Today, you know, some people, sometimes, in some places, are righteous. In our world, we have isolated spots of righteousness, oases of of faith. The world doesn't really seem to agree on anything in our world. Messiah is when everyone is there. Everyone is fully committed to God. Everyone is fully submitted to him. All evil will be eradicated. All false gods will be gone. Everyone will know. Everyone will understand. Everyone will be on the same page. Everyone will come around to see and recognize the creator. Very different world. And last time we inquired... How does this happen? What are the mechanisms by which Messiah can change the whole world so thoroughly, so substantially, so radically? And we spoke about four main catalysts. Maybe there are more than this, but four main catalysts that factor into this question. We talked about the eradication of the Yetzirah. There is part of the the messianic suite of changes is the elimination of evil. Well, if you remove the factors that cause us to be distanced from God, well, what, what remains? Just our innate affinity and fealty to the Almighty. That's one factor. A second factor, a second variable is Messiah himself, the force of personality of this incredible individual and how that will sweep the whole world in the direction of faith in God. We talked about the fact that there are miracles associated with Messiah and that too will change the calculus for humanity. And finally, we spoke about repentance, this national outpouring of a desire to return to God, and that too will ripple throughout the whole world. And again, I'm I'm always trying to remind you that we're trying to do this in stages methodically. We haven't gotten yet to the question of, well, what triggers that? What is the initial cause? Maybe that's something we don't even know. But what causes what? And what's the timeline of the transformation of Messiah? And our layout of this, it might not be chronological. And yes, there may be different ways that it can all play out. But at a basic level, we know for sure that these are factors that the sources tell us will play a role in the grand transformations of Messiah. And today, we're going to begin, please God, our study of these factors in depth. And we're going to start with the factor of the elimination of evil. 
in the times of Messiah, before the year 6,000, evil will be eliminated, will be mitigated, will be attenuated, will be curbed, will be limited in some way. The Yetzirah will be destroyed. It'll be slaughtered. Well, if you don't have the force that pushes you away from God, it can make a lot of sense how the whole world can resume their natural state of submission to God. But what does this mean? What do we know about this important change in the state of evil that will be present in messianic times? What do we know? What can we speculate? What can we posit? Moreover, what are the consequences? What are the implications of this reality? So we already saw some primary sources on this idea. Specifically, we talked about the verse in Devarim, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 6. The verse talks about how God will circumcise our heart and the heart of our children, and thereby we will love Hashem our God with all of our hearts and with all of our soul. God will circumcise our hearts. He's going to remove the blockages from our heart. And as he does tell us, this refers to the eradication of the evil inclination in the times of Messiah. Now, just to get us started, the verse uses very surprising terminology. Circumcision of the heart. This is very precise usage of, of a term. It's not just a random term. It's not just by coincidence. Regarding the evil inclination, the Yitzhara, the Talmud delineates seven different names of the Yitzhara. This is in the book of Sukkot on page 52a. There are seven names for the Yitzhara. God called it evil. Moshe called it uncircumcised. David called it impure. Solomon called it a hater. Isaiah called it a stumbling block. Ezekiel called it a stone. And the prophet Joel called it the thing that's hidden within me. We have a verse in scripture, and we have the Talmud that tells us that the Yetzirah is called a foreskin. It's called an uncircumcised one. And thus, on a basic level, well, if the Yetzirah is akin to a foreskin in some dimension, it can be circumcised. Now, it's interesting. There are two verses in the Torah that talk about circumcision of the heart. We spoke about Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. God will circumcise our heart. But we also have Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. In that verse, we're told, you should circumcise your own heart. So the notion, the concept of circumcision of the heart appears twice. In one, the quote-unquote mohel, the circumciser is God. And in one, it's us. So this process of circumcision of the heart, who, who does it? Is it us? Or is it God? I think the answer is, is obvious, really. Our mission is to remove the evil, to fix the world, to eliminate the force that's trying to create barriers and distance between us and our Creator. 
The mission is to circumcise the heart. That's the objective. That's the goal. Today, in current times, that is our mission. Prior to Messiah, prior to the whole Messianic era, our mission can be distilled to this, our task, to the best of your ability, as much as you can, circumcise your heart. When Messiah comes, that process is going to be given a divine oomph. God will circumcise our heart. Now, this idea fits very nicely with the Talmud that we mentioned last time. The Talmud gives a very dramatic description of the slaughtering of the Eight Sahara in the future. They might have to take the Eight Sahara and slaughter it before the righteous and before the wicked. We remember the Talmud. The righteous, it appears like a mountain, and the wicked, it appears like a strand of here, and they're crying, and they're crying. But who slaughters the Eight Sahara? In current times, it's our responsibility to eradicate the Eight Sahara, to circumcise our heart. With Messiah, apparently, God takes over. This element of the Messianic time is apparently done by God. It's ordained from above. God slaughters the Yetzirah. God circumcises the heart. There is yet another insight about the comparison of the Yetzirah to a foreskin, and that is what results from this form of circumcision. Our sages tell us that with circumcision, you remove something, but you automatically expose something else. Our sages tell us that circumcision is about the removal of one thing and the revelation of another thing. You remove the Yetzara, you remove the foreskin, and you reveal the crown. In our world, the crown of God is, is apparently not complete. The world is not fixed with the kingdom of God. God's throne, as the verse tells us in Exodus, is not complete. So long as the evil is present, so long as Amalek is a force in the world, God's throne, so to speak, is incomplete. The world is not perfected with the kingdom of God. But what happens once the Yetzirah is removed, once the foreskin is excised, is circumcised, Well, then by extension, the byproduct of that is that the crown of God will be revealed. And what will you discover? What will you unearth when you remove the evil inclination? You will just uncover what was always present. We have a soul within us. And if our soul was allowed to shine in its full brightness... That world that we described in the prayers about Messiah, that world will be very natural. If this world was comprised of just souls, free from any influence of the Yitzhara, it would very much match the world of Messiah that the prayers described. And thus, we have some context to this grand idea of Messiah and this wonderful transformation How does that happen? You remove the evil, and thereby you expose the crown. Now, there's some very deep ideas here being conveyed. We'll add one more deep idea to the cauldron. Our sages tell us that this process was done once or maybe twice in the opposite direction. Our sages tell us that Adam was created circumcised. 
but he reversed his circumcision. Says the Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, page 38, Adam pulled, so to speak, his foreskin and once again concealed the crown. And we know, our Sidus tells us, with Adam's sin, he was infused with a Yetzahara. Previously, he was just good. The force of evil was external to him. With Adam's sin, he became a mixture, an amalgam, a mashup, a fusion of good and evil. And that's the world that he leaves us with. Post Adam's sin, the world is defined as being one of a mixture, good and bad, both operating simultaneously. If the Yetzirah can be equated to a foreskin, it could be said about Adam, he was created circumcised, he was created without a Yetzirah, without an imminent force of evil, and he reversed it with his sin, he brought the Yetzirah into him. Accordingly, when we are told, and of course this is a subject that we mentioned already in the past, when we are told that in the times of Messiah, the Yetzirah will be circumcised, in effect, we are being told that we are going to be restored to the way things were prior to Adam's sin. That's a very lofty stature. It's a stature that very few people have ever, even individually, arrived at. To appreciate that, we can look at the Talmud, the book of Bava Basra, on page 16b, going into 17a. It's talking about the forefathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three people, when they were in this world, they managed to get a taste of Olam Abba. And they are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it quotes the verse, Bakol, Mikol, Kol. With Abraham, it says the word Bakol, which means throughout all of him. And with Isaac, it says the word Mikol, all, again, the term kol, which means all. And with Jacob, it said the word kol, all, meaning that the presence of God permeated them entirely. Continues the Talmud, three people did not have the control of the Sahara upon them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, he uses the verse, bakol, mikol, kol. The state of life, absent a Yetzahara, or the dominion of the Yetzahara, well, that's the level of the forefathers. And that's a taste of Olam Abba. That is a level that's supernally lofty. And that's the level of Messiah, not just for the individuals, but for the entire world. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they circumcised their own hearts, and they went through this messianic transformation as individuals, they worked assiduously to manually remove the Yetzra and all its vestiges from themselves. But they were total outliers. They were righteous individuals amidst a sea of wickedness and paganism. And of course, they made tremendous strides to influence others, but they were the outliers. In the times of Messiah... This circumcision, apparently, is done by God. We will all be artificially, divinely circumcised. And that's how the whole world will be elevated to the state of Adam pre-sin, to the level reached only by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the Talmud tells us that there are some very significant consequences to this 
change. The Talmud, the book of Shabbos, page 151b, tells us that there are days bereft of desire coming. These are the days of Messiah, the days where there is no righteousness and no wickedness. If we don't have a desire for evil, days without desire, then by definition, there cannot be any righteousness or wickedness. Because if you don't have to overcome the Yetzara, well, how can you be classified as righteous? It was done to you. And if, if there's no way it's about to push you to become wicked, of course, there's not going to be any wickedness. And thus, in our world, we see a lot of diversity or inequality in righteousness. Because everyone's on their own and everyone's fighting and some people are more successful than others. Some people fight and overcome. Some people yield and submit and succumb. Everyone has a different result. If the Yitzhah is removed, then there's no righteousness, there's no wickedness, there's nothing to resist against, there's nothing pushing in the opposite direction. There's no evil inclination for us to overcome, and therefore there's no righteousness, and there's no wickedness. Another way of saying this is that the free will that allows every person to either ascend and become more righteous or descend, degenerate, devolve and become more wicked, that's suspended in the world of Messiah. And that brings us back to the state of Adam pre-sin. I say this tell us that Adam technically theoretically had free will. But his free will to do a sin, in the words of the Nefesh Achayim, it was equivalent to the choice that we have to jump into a fire. If you see a burning furnace, can you jump into it? It would be highly inadvisable, of course, to do so. But do you have the choice to do so? You do. You don't have the desire to do so. That will be the state in the Messianic era. You may technically have free will, but you won't have the desire, and thus your free will will be greatly limited in its scope. You can say that free will will be suspended or curbed, or limited in some way. Now, as an aside, I know we're going very deep, we'll go just a little bit deeper. This is why Adam sinned. Adam wasn't happy not having desire. He wanted to have the evil inclination. He wanted the evil and the good operating within him simultaneously. He wanted the dynamism of the challenge. He wanted to have the greater upside and, of course, the downside risk as well. He wanted life to be more meaningful. And that's why he jumped into the fire and he reversed the circumcision and he willingly imbibed the Yetzirah. He knew exactly what he was getting himself into and he did it all willingly. And this raises the question, well, if the times of Messiah are like the times of Adam pre-sin, and humanity then coalesced in, in Adam, made a decision that that's not what we want, why do we want Messiah? Or why, when we are in a state of Adam pre-sin, in the times of Messiah, why won't we want to retrace Adam's sin again and reverse it all again to gain that 
myths of good and evil once again? That's a very advanced question. I think I have an answer. We'll put a pin in that because I think I think it's much later on down the line in our studies. But regardless, this is a major insight. One implication of Messiah and the removal of the Yetzirah is that our free will, to a certain extent, will be limited. And this brings with it a whole host of questions. It opens up the next realm of investigation for us. What is the nature of this elimination of evil, this reduction of the Yetzirah, this removal of the Yetzirah in the times of Messiah? Can, can we really understand that it's totally removed? That seems to be problematic. After all, the Yetzirah does serve a vital function. It does give life more dynamism and more opportunity and more meaning and more purpose. The days of Messiah are days without desire. Yomim asheimim chifetz, there's no desire. Will the days of Messiah be dull? And listless? Is that really what we're hoping for? Furthermore, my grandfather, blessed memory, asked a wonderful question by noting that there's actually a precedent for this. There was one time in history when the Yetzirah was limited. Our saints tell us in a few places in the Talmud, Book of Sanhedrin, Book of Yoma, page 69b, With the beginning of the Second Temple era, the men of the Great Assembly assembled and prayed and fasted for three days to eliminate the Yetzahara for idolatry. They argued and they petitioned and they reasoned, we don't want it and we don't want its reward. And after three days of intensive prayer and petitioning, the Almighty delivered to them the Yetzirah of idolatry. And then they figured, well, let's, let's go the whole distance. Let's eliminate the other evil inclinations for promiscuity. So they continued their prayer and they were again successful in eliminating the Yetzirah. But then they were faced with some problems. If you eliminate the Yetzirah for promiscuity, will the world have continuity? So they weren't sure what to do. So they decided to wait a couple days and see what happens. And a few days later, they needed a fresh egg for a sick person. And even the chickens and the roosters had stopped to procreate. So they said, wait a minute, maybe we went a little too far because we eliminated the Yetzirah for dynamism, for procreation, for promiscuity. What do we do now? We can't really ask to eliminate this desire partially. The mind doesn't give us partial gifts. So Talmud there tells us what they actually did, but they essentially restored the Yetzirah. What the Talmud is telling us is that the Yetzirah serves as a force that ensures the world's continuity. Is that going to cease? Will we be unable to find a fresh egg in Messianic times? Will people cease to procreate in Messianic times? As we mentioned in the past, the Talmud, the Ramam, tells us that the difference between these two worlds, between this world and the world of Messiah, is very limited. It's very minimal. It's not that great. 
There's no difference between our world and the world of Messiah, only Shibud Malchus Bavad, only the submission to foreign rulers. Absent the Yitzharah, there's a very significant difference between our world and Messiah. Moreover, Messiah is described as a time of hunger, of thirst for the word of God. The knowledge of God will cover the land like water covers the seabed. Can't be that we're just operating by rote, habit, routine, following our instincts. There's going to be hunger. How can there be hunger and desire absent a Yitzhahara? How can there be hunger and desire in days that there is no desire? So how exactly do we understand this idea of the elimination of the Yitzhahara in the days of Messiah? How is that not going to lead to the destruction of the world? What exactly do we mean do our sages mean when they talk about the elimination of the Yitzhara in the times of Messiah? So what we discover when we analyze the sources in depth is that somehow the Yitzhara is eliminated, yet the world is not rendered into being listless and stale and stagnant. The Yitzhara is maybe partially removed, but enough is left over to give the world some excitement, some buzz, some dynamism. For example, the Ramchal, in his work Das Tvunos, he's talking about the world after the resurrection. So remember, we have our world, and our world's going to last uh, 6,000 years. Before 6,000 years, Messiah's got to come and fix the whole world before 6,000 arrives. And then the world is put to rest, put to sleep, put on ice, hibernates for a 1,000 years. We'll talk more about these 1,000 years in a little bit. The water is going to swamp over the land, and the righteous will fly like birds, but not getting tired, whatever that means. But just as a person is buried to be reborn, the world is buried to be reborn. 6,000 years, and then a 1,000 years of rest, and then it's rebuilt again for Ol Maba. And Ramchal is talking about what's going to be after the resurrection. The people will be restored like angels. Not like donkeys! They will be free of all physicality and all of its after effects. As an example, they will be free of the eight Sahara. Again, he's not talking about the Messianic era. After 6,000 years and after the seventh millennium, and then the world is rebuilt and the people are restored with the resurrection, and they're going to be very different than the people that we are used to today. They won't be like donkeys, they'll be like angels. And he adds, and even in the days of Messiah, the verse says, I will remove the stone heart from your flesh. And it quotes the Talmud. There will be days without desire. These are the days of Messiah, that there's no righteousness and there's no wickedness. If you read this piece in Ramchal, he seems to differentiate between the eradication of the Yitzhara in the world after the resurrection versus the eradication of the Yitzhara in the world of Messiah. So perhaps there are two eradications of the Yitzhara. Moreover, the Talmud that we mentioned earlier, the Almighty in the future, will take the Yitzhara and slaughter it in front of the righteous and in front of the wicked. 
The Baal Shem Tov noted, the Talmud does not say that the Almighty takes the Yitzhara and kills it in front of the righteous and the wicked. It says, slaughters it. Vishokhto, it slaughters it. And of course, we know that the words of our Sadists were written with great precision. The term that the Talmud uses to describe the elimination of the Yitzhahara, and again, I want to stress this. I mentioned this in the past. I want to stress this again because I want to be very precise. This Talmud does not explicitly say this is talking about the removal of the Yitzhahara in the times of Messiah. It says in the future. We can maybe speculate that it's talking about the times of Messiah, but we don't, we don't know that for sure. But what word does it use? It uses the word slaughters. This is the term that's used for the slaughtering of an animal. You want to have kosher beef, you have to have a kosher animal. But if you have a cow, the cow's not kosher until it's been slaughtered. The process of slaughtering is the process of taking something that has the potential to be kosher and actualizing that said potential. Says the Baal Shem Tov, this process is not describing the elimination of the Yitzhahara, but the koshering, the rendering, of, the rendering of it as kosher. The taking of the Yitzhahara and transforming it from being non-kosher to being kosher. Taking the evil and removing it and keeping just the good parts, not eliminating the Yitzhahara, but defaming it. And thus, perhaps we can say that free will will be changed, will be altered, but it won't be eliminated entirely. The Yitzhahara will still be there, but now in a kosher version. Now, this idea is well developed in the Talmud and elsewhere, that actually what's ideal is not to eliminate the Yitzhahara, but to channel it properly. For example, the Talmud, the Talmud of the Book of Kiddushin on page 30b tells us that the Almighty tells the Jewish people, I have created the Yitzhahara, but I created Torah as an antidote. Barasi lo Torah tavlin. Torah is the antidote. Now the word tavlin means antidote, but it also means spice. So the commentaries tell us what's ideal is not to remove and eliminate the Yitzhahara, but to spice it, to improve it, to slaughter it, to make it kosher. And maybe that's the nature of the elimination of evil in times of Messiah. Moreover, the Talmud, in that same page, in Kiddushan on page 30b, tells us, if the Yitzhahara attacks you, drag him with you to the base Madrash, the Academy of Learning. Now, if the Yitzhara was just an unmitigated evil, you wouldn't want him with you in the academy. You'd want him far away from you. Evidently, if you could find a way to to channel the Yitzhara to be an asset for you in the academy, well, that's ideal. Drag him with you to the academy. Deploy him in the base medrash, because that is the best of both worlds. The midrash tells us, quoting a verse, if your enemy is hungry, feed him bread, says the midrash, your enemy, that's the Yitzhahara. And bread, that's Torah. Take the Yitzhahara and feed it Torah. Now it is an asset, not a liability. So when our sages tell us 
that the Eight Sarah is going to be slaughtered, eliminated, maybe, maybe there is still some dynamism because the Eight is now rendered kosher. Now, this notion that the elimination of the Eight is not necessarily the complete eradication of choice. This notion is echoed in the commentary of Ramban to the aforementioned verse in Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your children, and you'll love Hashem your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So the Ramban gives, gives us the context of this. Since creation, we have, we have choice. We have free will. We can be righteous. We can be wicked. And when we make choices, well, we earn either merit or punishment. But in the times of Messiah, our choice to do good will be natural. If you read the Ramban very carefully, he doesn't say there's not going to be any choice. There will still be choice, but the choice to do good will be natural. And the heart will not desire something that's inappropriate for it. The things that are harmful for you you won't covet at all. And that's what's referred to in this circumcision of the heart. Because lust and desire are like a foreskin for the heart. And the circumcision of the heart, that's to remove the desire, the lust, for the things that are harmful. And in that time, man will be restored to the way man was prior to the sin of Adam that man will do naturally what is appropriate to do. But man will not be bedeviled by wanting one thing and having simultaneously the opposing desire to do the opposite. In our life, there is there's dissonance, there's resistance. We want to do mitzvot, we want to study Torah. We want to follow our intellect to do what's right. But we also have inclinations to do things that are not right, that are inappropriate. And there's a different domain, so to speak, operational within us. We have good impulses and bad impulses, good characteristics and bad characteristics. And we have sometimes an inclination to get angry, to do terrible things, to be violent. On the other hand, we want to do good, we want to be righteous, we want to be kind, we want to be hospitable. You look at Abraham and you see what it's like when we have a person who is not conflicted. Abraham, he also does kindness. And he also de- deploys anger. He's hospitable, but he also distances himself from other people. And he also uses violence sometimes. But in every instance, he's doing what's right. For the passerby, he offers kindness and hosp- hospitality. When Ishmael goes awry, he banishes him. And it's very cold to him. And when Lot is a bad influence, he sends him away. And when it's appropriate for him to engage in warfare, he does, as is described in chapter 14 of Genesis. Abram also has these qualities of kindness and anger and violence and goodness and hospitality. But there's no dissonance. There's no conflict. Every quality, every attribute, every trait is given its right time and place 
for when it is proper to deploy it. Similarly, when we talk about Torah, and we have the idea of lust, and they seem to be such opposites in our world. One is the domain of the, the soul and the Yetzir Tov, the good inclination. And one's the, the body and physicality and pursuit of pleasure, on the other hand. In Messiah, we're going to be like Abraham. All those forces will still be present. But what's going to be in charge is the soul, like Adam prior to his sin, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to have the impulses, so to speak, that are currently the domain of the Eight Sahara. We're going to commandeer them from the Eight Sahara and have a good version of all of these. And thus, the world can still have its dynamism and excitement, but all in a kosher fashion. Finally, I have some speculation of my own that I want to share with y'all. The Talmud tells us that one of the great sages, after he finished praying, he would add an optional prayer of his own. And the optional prayer that he would supplicate, he would tell God, you know that it is our will to do your will. And what inhibits us? What stops us from doing your will? The leaven in the bread and the dominion of foreign rulers. Se'or Shabi'isa, the leaven in the bread, v'shibud malchios, and the dominion of foreign rulers. May it be the will before you, May you agree to it, that we be saved from these two forces and we return to do your will wholeheartedly. In part one of my book, Upon a Ten-String Tarp, I spend a lot of time focusing on this Talmud and the idea of the two elements of the Yitzhahara. The Yitzhahara is this foreign god, this evil inclination. But we prove in the book that there are two elements, two aspects of it. There's the internal Yetzirah and the external Yetzirah. And they each try to impel a person to sin in different ways. And in the book we prove, or we speculate, we posit, we espouse the theory that the leaven in the bread, the agent that puffs up the bread, converts matzah into chametz, that's a reference to the external yetzahara. The external yetzahara is this idea of taking something which is a necessary nutrient. It can serve as fuel for a journey. And it gets transformed into a value of its own, something to pursue as an end onto its own. That's the external Yetzahara. The control of the foreign rulers, the second, the second inhibitor for us doing the will of God, according to this prayer, well, that's the internal Yetzahara that maintains dominion over a person. And what's that called? That's called Shibud Malchios, the dominion of foreign rulers. Isn't it interesting that when our sages differentiate between this world and the world of Messiah, the Talmud uses the identical words. Ein bein olam azelimus Mashiach el Shibud Malchios bavad. The only difference between this world and the world of Messiah is dominion of foreign rulers. So we always thought it meant that, well, you have uh, this government and that government, and this empire and this kingdom. The Messiah comes, we'll have our own kingdom. We won't have the dominion of foreign rulers. But maybe, just maybe, 
when the Talmud uses the identical words to describe the thing that inhibits us to have a relationship with God, and as we speculated in my book, maybe that's referring to an element, half, so to speak, of the Eight Sahara. Maybe when the Talmud talks about Messiah as not having Shibun Malchios, maybe it's referring to one element of the Eight Sahara. So maybe we can speculate that in the world of Messiah, one element of the Eight Sahara is not present, but the other element is still there. And thus, maybe that's the understanding of the times of Messiah and why or how there can still be dynamism and hunger and thirst while not having a Yitzhahara present. Regardless, we have come a long way in understanding our fundamental question and that is, what is the mechanism of Messiah? How is there such radical change in the times of Messiah? And we learned about the concept of the elimination of the Yitzhara. And we understand, of course, that absent and evil inclination, it's natural for the soul to shine. And yes, to a certain extent, merit will be devalued. But to the best of our understanding, there will still be hunger and there will still be thirst and there will still be dynamism in the times of Messiah, hunger and thirst for the word of God. I want to end off with one very nice idea, courtesy of Maharal, with a wonderful illustration. We talk about Messiah coming and this whole process of the Messianic transformation and the Messianic revolution and the deposing of the Yitzhahara and the installing of God as the dominion over all. And the Almighty coming and circumcising the heart and apparently artificially completely changing the calculus and improving everyone and elevating everyone. And everyone becomes subservient completely to God. And this radical improvement in the state of righteousness in the world. And the Talmud says, well, there's, there's, no, there's no improvement. There's no righteousness in the times of Messiah. And there's no wickedness in the times of Messiah. Is there room for elevation in the times of Messiah? Is it all going to be us passively being elevated by God? Or can we get some credit or some merit and be elevated to higher heights in the times of Messiah? So the Maharal compares this to the concept of Eruv Tafshilin. Eruv Tafshilin. Now what is Eruv Tafshilin? We know that on Shabbos, we are not allowed to cook. On festivals, we are allowed to cook. Of course, there are some details and laws about how exactly you ought to do that. But you're allowed to cook on festivals for usage on said festivals. What about when there's a festival, let's say on a Friday, and then that goes back to back with Shabbos that comes afterwards? You're allowed to cook on Friday on the festival for usage in that festival. But you cannot cook on Friday on the festival for usage on Shabbos. Unless you make an Eruv Tafshilin, which is a halachic device that permits you to cook on Friday 
for usage not on Friday, but on Shabbos. And the way this halachic device works is that you have to start cooking for Shabbos before the festival. On Thursday, when it's still the weekday, preceding the festival. If you cook a little bit, start cooking on on Thursday for Shabbos, then even on Friday, which is a festival, you're allowed to continue the cooking for Shabbos. That's the concept of Erev Tavshilin. Now, we already know, the Talmud tells us explicitly, that this world, to Olam Abba, is like weekday to Shabbos. And we're trying to cook, to prepare, in the weekday, for Shabbos, for Olam Abba. That's already clear in the Talmud, the book of Avodah Zarah, page 3a. We've mentioned it in the past. Well, if this world is a weekday and Olam Abba is Shabbos, what is the Messianic era? The answer is that the Messianic era is like a festival. So you go not from this world to Shabbos, you go from this world to the festival, and the festival to Shabbos. This world to the Messiah, and Messiah to Olam Abba. Can we prepare in the times of Messiah for Shabbos, so to speak, for Olam Abba? It depends. If you start preparing in this world prior to the festival, prior to Messiah, then you can continue the preparation on the festival in the times of Messiah for Olam Abba. And thus, even though the Talmud tells us that there's no improvement, there's no righteousness, no wickedness in the times of Messiah, Maral tells us that if we start now in this world prior to Messiah, the continuation of that, so to speak, cooking for Shabbos can continue on the festival in the times of Messiah. We've learned a lot. We've covered a great distance. We've seen four different ways of presenting the idea of how the Eighth Row will not be eliminated entirely, completely. The world will not be rendered stale and stagnant. The Eighth Row will be slaughtered. It will be upgraded to being productive. It's going to be eliminated in stages, Ramchal tells us. There will still be something left during the Messianic times. Ramban, in his essay to Devarim 36, tells us that we will still have choice, but we will naturally choose good. And we talked about my theory of the two elements of the Yitzharah, only one of them will be eliminated in the times of Messiah. Of course, many questions remain. How exactly it gets eliminated? Of course, the Talmud apparently tells us that it's done by God. But how exactly it works, that is still a major mystery. And even though the Talmud tells us that it's going to be slaughtered by God, we've already been accustomed to the idea that there's probably some nuance in that. And that angle we have yet to address. But I think we have taken a chunk out of this subject There's a lot more to uncover and to ponder. And please, God, next time we will talk about the persona of Messiah himself, this individual, this king that will arise, that will come on a donkey, we're told. This towering figure who's going to change the whole world. That is on our agenda for next time. This was delightful to study with y'all. I'm in the Torch Center you are wherever you are. I appreciate your your friendship and your kindness and your listenership. And if you want to send me an email to talk about this subject or any other subject, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.